Uh, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction into linguistic linked open data, speaking about roots and foundations, um, in particular what linguistic data is meant in this context, linked data um, about open data, and all of these, uh, how they constitute uh, constitute uh, linguistic linked open data. And of course, uh, I will about things beyond open data. So the technology is relevant for commercial use cases as well. Uh, interoperability has long been recognized as a major issue in the language resource community, and it has been addressed accordingly. However, so far, this did not lead to a unified language resource infrastructure. Instead, we have different infrastructures with regional or nor did it lead to a unified format to encode language resources or to protocols for accessing them. There is a lot of work, of course, and there are proposals, however, by different communities, different initiatives, and partially interoperable only. And uh, given the current state of affairs, it's actually unlikely that uh, this will happen anytime soon, because it just involves very different and very distributed communities. And of course, Clarin provides major steps in this direction, but it's still some way to go. Uh, today we're going to talk about one possible strategy uh, to address such interoperability issues. It's not the only strategy, uh, but it's a prospective direction to take. Um, Link data can be seen as a way to add an additional layer of interoperability over heterogeneous, very much in line with the FAIR principles. Um, Likewise, it's often combined with an attitude towards open source and open access, and this is why you might have heard about linked open data. Since uh, 2010, uh, we're working on building a linguistic linked open data cloud. You can find the current version of that under linguisticlot.org. It comprises numerous uh, language resources um, published in accordance with the linked open data principles, including but not limited to lexical resources, corpora, databases, and terminology. So what does linguistic data mean in this context? And actually, we had a very long discussion on that. Um, and in the end, we settled for something very broad. So by linguistic data in this context, we mean linguistically relevant data. That is data that has been created or used for linguistic research and or lexicography and uh, this also includes resources that are not strictly speaking um, language resources but also general knowledge bases that have multilingual information for example the dbpedia um, link data refers to a set of rules of best practice for publishing data on the web um, and this includes protocols and standards and the requirement to uh, provide links between those data sets However, before we dive into this any more deeply, first a brief digression into RDF, because this is one of the cornerstones of linked open data. RDF, the Resource Description Framework, is a W3C standard that uh, formalizes um, labeled directed multigraphs as its core data structure. So we speak about nodes, and in RDF, they are referred to as RDF resources. And a node is basically anything we want to provide information about. Uh, we speak about edges, or in RDF, we would say RDF properties, which uh, are used to assign a subject, um, either another node, an object, or a value, a literal. Um, nodes and edges are unambiguously identified by uniform resource identifiers. And those can, for example, be HTTP URLs as you know them from your browser. And here's a brief example. Um, in the first line, you see a statement from a particular thesaurus um, that apparently is in Dutch, which says something about the Bronze Age. The property is RDF type, which means that we assign uh, this individual a particular type or category. And this category is also defined in this thesaurus, and it's a period. So this basically means that the Bronze Age is a period. You see it here in two ways. One is a textual representation, the turtle format, which is one of the standard serializations of RDF, and a graphical view that is more a conceptual way to represent information. You might have noticed that this does not look like a conventional AI. And this is because the um, namespace prefixes have been used to abbreviate that, but they can actually be extended. So uh, RDF colon, can be extended to the following HTTP path. And uh, this is something you can actually write 
uh, into your browser and take a look and just see what it returns you with additional information about RDF type. So how it's defined, for example. Uh, we can add more information about the Braunstadt object. So for example, we can say that it has a preferred label in the German language, which would be Bronzezeit, or in English, which would be Bronze Age, or in Dutch. And in this way, we can construct arbitrarily complex graphs. Um, as I said, uh, these are two possible visualizations. The first is a commonly applied format, the turtle format. The second is a conceptual view that you could describe as a graph view with graph in the same sense as in mathematics. Um, first, a word on some common misunderstandings on RDF. RDF is not to be confused with RDF XML. Uh, in fact, RDF XML is one possible format, but there are a number of other RDF serializations that all have different characteristics. Turtle was shown before, but there's also a JSON dialect. Um, there is a binary format, RDF HTT, and there are several others for different kinds of applications. In fact, RDF is not a format at all. It is an abstract data model. And uh, this has a number of implications. And one of those implications is actually that uh, when you want to embrace RDF technology, this doesn't necessarily mean that you have to abandon pre-RDF technology. Instead, uh, RDF uh, standards are designed to integrate with existing formats, like, for example, JSON-LD is an extension of JSON, uh, RDF-A can integrate in XML or in HTML, RDF-XML is a way to provide semantic markup for uh, documents otherwise provided in XML. Furthermore, there are standards for wrapping non-RDF content as RDF content. Uh, for example, the RDF mapping language that allows you to provide an RDF view over a relational database. Um, RDF uh, has a number of interesting features and it uh, facilitates reusability and linking of resources. Um, because RDF resources and edges are defined by URIs, um, they can also be accessed remotely, uh, at least if they are HTTP URLs. Um, this allows to reuse elements. So for example, to develop vocabularies that are being referred to from the outside. So you don't have to define them within every individual data set. Uh, another possible application is to uh, provide links between different resources. So basically saying that, for example, two pieces of information to entities are the same across those resources. And basically those kinds of links is what constitutes the link to open data cloud that comprises a great variety of resources that are linked with each other and released under an open license. Link data on this basis is defined as a set of rules of best practice. Informally, they can be summarized as follows. Uh, first is that you need to use your eyes or IRIs as names for things so um, that uh, you can basically um, resolve them with standard protocols. Um, and if these URIs uh, can be resolved via HTTP and they provide information as RDF or in related standards, and they include links to other URIs, then we refer to this as linked data. Um, linked data is often coupled, as I said, with open uh, data. And uh, there is the five star system where you get the first star for making the data available on the web under an open license, the second star for making it available as structured content, the third star for using non proprietary data, the fourth star for using a linked data format, that is, your eyes to identify things and RDF to represent data, and the final star for linking your data with the content of other people to provide additional content. You might recognize those criteria because they're pretty closely related to the FAIR principles. And indeed, uh, some people view uh, linked open data as a prototypical implementation of fairness. And following a similar spirit, uh, the idea of linked open data has been readily accepted in science and a great number of data sets has been produced, as you can see in the uh, linked open data cloud as of today. Um, of course, this idea has also found some resonant resonance within uh, the language resource and linguistics communities. Um, and if you think about this about 10 years ago, we already had the situation that we had a lot of digital language resources, dictionaries, opera, linguistic databases, and so on. And many of those were available uh, over the web, uh, but often distributed 
data silos using incompatible standards, protocols, tools, and sometimes those incompatibilities were vividly defended by their respective user and developer communities. At the same time, you also had general interest in consolidation at the time, even for quite a while. So, for example, there was the gold ontology, there was ISOCAT, there were a number of uh, ISO standards in development. And also, there was some consensus that graphs represent a universal or, say, most general way to model language resources. Um, different concepts had been introduced until this point, um, for example, annotation graphs, directed acyclic graphs, or feature structures, but in the end, they can be reduced to graphs. And this is exactly what RDF technology provides you as well. But, um, furthermore, uh, at this time, we still had a lot of, uh, grow, of growing enthusiasm about open data, knowledge, open access, open source. And taken together, this led to the proposal of creating a linguistic link to open data cloud that materialized in 2012 as a result of a workshop, an associated book, and a hackathon. In 2014, it was recognized as a top level category in the linked open data cloud. And um, a lot has happened afterwards. Uh, one of those developments um, that were very influential was, for example, the development of the Ontolex vocabulary that led very much to the consolidation of specifications for lexical resources and contributed a lot to the growth of the cloud afterwards. Today, we have numerous projects and a number of uh, W3C community groups working specifically on the topic. So this is well on development. Um, yes, and this is basically the point where we can tackle what lies beyond um, link to open data in this context, and because actually that's just the tip of an iceberg. The technology can be much more broadly applied. Um, common vocabularies drive new technologies, and this is not restricted to open resources. So here again, a quick view on the Ontolex model. Um, proprietary applications have been developed on this basis. So there is non-open linguistic linked data, and this is actually why um, this cafe today is not called linguistic linked open data, but linguistic linked data. And in addition to that, uh, there are actually vast amounts of open RDF data available that are still unlinked. One of the reasons for why they are unlinked is that it's hard or can be hard to find hosting services that provide resolvable URIs for RDF media types. Um, However, if this issue could be addressed, um, there would be great amounts of data that could be readily produced as RDF data if a sustainable hosting solution could be secured. Um, I would like to give acknowledgments to a number of projects that have supported me in particular, and in addition to Pratilot and Nexus Linguarum that other will mention as well, I would also like to point out uh, the support from the Linked Open Dictionaries project and the Linguistic Portal and would hand over to...